This is the Reichstag in Berlin. In 1945, it was captured by the Russians. The victory helped confirm the division of Germany and later of the whole of Europe into East and West. But this is the story of a battle which might have changed all that. A battle for the bridges over the Rhine, which might just have put the Union Jack on the Reichstag instead of the red flag. The concept was brilliant and it could and should have worked. And the war would have been ended in six months earlier. It's the story of Operation Market Garden. With the D-Day landings in June 1944, the Western Allies' assault on Nazi Germany began triumphantly. But fighting their way off the beaches and on through northern France became a bitter struggle. I don't think it's generally appreciated that the speed at which a battalion bled to death was higher in Normandy than it was on the Somme. Extremely thick hedges, some of them a thousand years old. An absolute defender's paradise. The Germans fought hard in Normandy for nearly three months. And then at last, the dam broke. Near Falaise, the Germans were caught between the Americans and the British, and their armies were shattered. As the survivors fell back towards Germany, the Allies pursued them, advancing more than 250 miles in less than three weeks. It was beyond our wildest dreams. We did 97 miles in something like 12 hours which was the fastest advance of a division in history. First Paris, then Brussels were liberated. The Belgians were absolutely wonderful. And, um, you know, they all jumped on our tanks with bottles of champagne and we had a wonderful time in Brussels. The troops were elated. The Germans were weak. And just a few hundred miles away lay the Reich's industrial heartland, the Ruhr, where much of its weapons and ammunition were made. If the Allies could capture that, the road to Berlin would be open. But there was a problem. The web of rivers and canals separating Germany from France and the Low Countries. This is the Waal, one of the biggest rivers. Getting across these was, in its way, as hard for the Allies as it was for Hannibal to get his elephants over the Alps. Attacking across them was difficult enough, but then the Allies would have to send over a mass of trucks, supplies and guns. There were only a few places where this was possible, even if the bridges hadn't been blown, yet solve the problem and the war might indeed be over by Christmas. The British commander was Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. He had planned and led the D-Day landings. As the extent of his success became clear, Montgomery became desperate to exploit the German weakness. His headquarters came up with a daring plan, but it had to be carried out within a week before the Germans could reorganize. The plan was called Market Garden. The plan called for British tanks under Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks to punch their way over the waterways through Eindhoven and Nijmegen to the Rhine at Arnhem. Once across the Rhine, the British would be able to threaten the Ruhr or perhaps even push forward to Berlin. There were eight bridges and eight major waterways between Germany and the Allied front line. Each one of them would have to be taken intact and held if Market Garden was to succeed. So the Allies decided on a daring and original idea. They would mount the biggest airborne operation in history. 30,000 men of the first Allied Airborne Army 
would land behind the German lines and capture those eight vital bridges which Horrocks tanks would have to cross. They'd been kept in reserve since D-Day. Operation after operation had been cancelled. Now they had their chance. Well, my first reaction was one of enormous enthusiasm and excitement because, as I said, this was the first time that anyone on our side had contemplated the proper strategic use of airborne forces en masse. There would be three airborne divisions, two American and one British. Dropping by parachute and in gliders, these divisions would land near Eindhoven, Nijmegen and Arnhem to take the bridges. The planners called this an airborne carpet, over which the advancing British army could push through to Germany. The airborne corps commander was the British Lieutenant General Boy Browning. He and his men had just seven days to prepare. What nobody knew precisely was how many Germans the airborne troops would face when they landed. But information was flowing in from a variety of sources. First, there was aerial photography, which produced pictures like this. And there was signals intelligence from broken German codes. As the soldiers prepared for battle, all this information began to build into an alarming picture. The code breakers suggested that there were two SS Panzer divisions in the Arnhem area. Panzer divisions, with their large numbers of armored vehicles, could be devastating to the lightly armed parrots. At least one intelligence officer became seriously concerned. Major Brian Urquhart was on General Browning's staff at Corps headquarters. His analysis was chilling. He took me into his office and he showed me photographs of German Panzer IVs, mainly, I think they were, tucked in underneath woods. And uh, he went to General Browning and said that, in his view, the uh, operation, Market Garden operation, was, uh, could not succeed. The operation was on a timetable and nearing its deadline. Should it be delayed or even cancelled? In real war, Intelligence is often imprecise, and Urquhart might have been wrong. Time was getting short. Browning decided that Market Garden would go ahead. He sent Urquhart on sick leave. They said that his nerve had broken, which, of course, I think that Browning uh, had every right to make his own judgment. Uh, my own view is that um, Urquhart was a very brilliant chap. He knew what he was suggesting, and uh, that was the end of it. But Urquhart was right. The Germans were strengthening their defences. With only seven days in hand, the planning for the operation exposed flaws in the Allied setup. British and American soldiers and airmen all had their own agenda. There were disagreements and the inevitable compromises. The air operation was commanded by an American Air Force general, Lewis Brereton. He decided that there were simply too few aircraft to deliver all the airborne troops in one go. Therefore, they would be dropped over three days. Some British airmen disagreed. They suggested that because British pilots were used to flying over Europe at night, there could be two lifts, at least on the first day. But some British airborne soldiers were also unhappy. They were concerned about where they were to be dropped. In some cases, this was up to eight miles from their objective, the Arnhem Bridges. The vital element of surprise, which had worked so well in Normandy, would be lost, but Brereton was adamant. All in all, nobody was really happy with the plan. And over all this loomed one great unanswered question. How many Germans were there on the ground? Nobody really knew.
the soldiers who were to fight their way up the airborne carpet to Arnhem, the troops of 30 Corps, were in good spirits after several spectacular weeks. As far as 30 Corps was concerned, it was in that flush of delight to be out of the bloodbath in the Normandy Bocage. And this, the beginning of Market Garden, was great fun. In a cinema behind the front line, General Horrocks briefed his officers. He was a charismatic officer who had fought with Montgomery in the desert campaigns. He stimulated people. He, he, he brought a sense of, of urgency and, and, and confidence. He radiated confidence. Rather Horrocks briefing was pure theatre. Horrocks strode in and very nonchalantly said, I'm now going to tell you about an operation that you can tell your grandchildren about. A mighty bored they'll be. I can remember thinking what a very good salesman Horrocks was. On Sunday, the 17th of September, the Air Armada took off. It was spread right over the sky. You, you, you just stood in wonder. You didn't know we had so many aircraft, as it were. You know, you were surprised. And of course, don't forget, they were trailing gliders as well. Watching from a factory near the front line, General Horrocks saw the planes with the airborne troops pass over him on their way north. He gave the order to attack. Six hundred guns opened fire. The tanks moved forward with the Irish guards in the lead. The offensive had begun. It was down this road that the Irish Guards attacked that afternoon. Behind them, the column stretched back for 50 miles. Troops, trucks, guns, bridging equipment and assault boats. The road was only wide enough for two vehicles to pass. And every single bullet, bomb and tin of bully beef would have to come this way. A few hundred yards ahead of them, British guns laid down a wall of high explosive, a creeping barrage that moved slowly forward at just eight miles an hour. We were somewhat wary because one had a front, one road wide, going 60 miles into Indian territory. So you, you kept your eyes east and west in case you were going to be attacked. As they rumbled forward behind the barrage, they had little idea of the German positions. In fact, the Germans were waiting for them just three miles from the British start line. These hollows are the remains of German trenches. They'd been dug in here with some anti-tank guns, but the barrage had destroyed the guns. All they had left were light, handheld anti-tank weapons. As the British came up the road, the Germans sat tight and waited for their chance. The Germans let eight tanks pass their position before opening fire. Then they made their move. All of a 
a sudden we stopped. And the bad news began to filter back and you could see the black smoke going up. And uh, we lost nine tanks in a row. The whole 50-mile column ground to a halt. A few German foot soldiers had stopped an army. If the plan was to work, every minute counted, and it took the Irish guards another 40 minutes to resume their advance. That morning, the men of the British Airborne Division also had a sense of confidence as they took off. September the 17th, an enormous feeling of excitement, and I think a lot of the ones who had fought in North Africa and realised just how tough the Germans could be uh, were a bit sceptical, but um, in the main, the rest were so fed up with being buggered, buggered about uh, 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 after 16 um, cancelled operations that uh, they said, oh, Christ's sake, let's get on with it. Um, le let's go. Let's do it. The British paratroopers' drop zone was near Arnhem, north of the Rhine, 60 miles behind the German lines. There was almost no opposition on the landing grounds. The British had achieved total surprise. It's an immense armada. It's a lovely day. Uh, hardly any flak. No German fighters to upset us. So, as a ride, it was a dolly. As a drop, it was perfect. And the whole brigade was ready to move off in an hour. paratroopers were in a hurry. They had to collect all their kit and march on towards their objective, Arnhem and its bridges, which lay six miles away through woods and villages. The, the first problem that I realised was that on both sides of this road were some fairly high wire fences. And I realised that if we ran into trouble, we were going to have a very narrow front to organise our, ourselves on. We wouldn't be able to do anything about it. The British commander, Major General Roy Urquhart, was fighting with one hand tied behind his back. Only half the division had landed that day, and half these men would have to dig in to protect the landing zones for the next contingent. This left only a quarter of the division to strike out for the bridge. General Urquhart sent his reconnaissance squadron ahead in jeeps to make a dash for the bridge but the German troops near Arnhem had already reacted to the landings. German rifles, machine guns and mortars pounded the advancing British. This is where the battle took place. You can still see where the mortar bombs fell. Here, where the grass is growing thicker in the craters. There was now no chance of a lightning seizure of the all-important bridge. Just as with the guards' tanks, 60 miles away to the south, and at about the same time, a scratch group of German infantry was holding up a much larger British force. The German line on that ridge lay squarely in the path of two of the three parachute battalions. Neither would be able to reach the bridge as planned that day. We'd, we'd actually run into the main defence line that had been set up by the Germans to defend Arnhem. It was quite evident to all of us on the ground that we weren't going to get there by going forwards. So we'd either got to go left or go right. And all it needed was an answer to go left or right. But Clemenson and his fellow officers didn't get their answers. Due to some peculiarity of the land at Arnhem, the radios the airborne men had brought with them didn't work very well. Company commanders couldn't speak to their COs, who in turn couldn't reach the senior commanders. With his troops split up, 
In contact with the enemy and with faulty radios, no one knew what was happening. Urquhart was in a very difficult position. Luckily for him, one of his battalions found a way round the German line. Led by Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, they targeted a road running along the river into the town. It was almost unguarded. They could soon see the outline of the railway bridge. But as they approached, the Germans blew it up. Undaunted, the soldiers pressed on towards the town, hoping to reach the other bridge, the road bridge, before the Germans could close the gap. At about 8 p.m., after only five hours of marching and fighting, Lieutenant Colonel John Frost Parras reached the road bridge. It was the divisional objective, and they'd got it. Today, none of the buildings which surrounded the bridge in those days survive. In 1944, buildings crowded close to the bridge and dominated the approach. In these houses, Frost's men worked up defensive positions. You first, of course, the first thing to do is to knock all the glass out of the windows and break up any furniture you, you, you require to uh, give yourself protection from your firing position. That evening, Tony Hibbert managed to contact his brigadier. He urged him to send more troops down the river road to the bridge. And he uh, replied that he wouldn't, that they were engaged, fully engaged, and that they would rest for the night. Of course, they'd only been fighting for about five hours, and that's not the moment to start resting. It was a very, a very unwise decision, in my view. About 700 men were holding the north end of the bridge as night fell on the first day of Market Garden. They waited for their comrades to join them in the morning. About 60 miles away, Horrocks's tanks were bedding down for the night, already well behind schedule. They had come only seven miles from their start line. They stopped for the night here in the town of Valkenswad. They'd had a hard day. Their tanks needed refueling and were desperately vulnerable in the dark. But they were still six miles from Eindhoven, their first objective, and 10 from the American airborne forces with whom they were to link up. We'd lost other tanks. We'd lost infantry. Nobody liked stopping. We knew and we were very aware of the need to press on. We'd been given the rough timetable, even down to me, knew how, how important, vitally important it was to get up to the airborne. The operation was behind schedule, and all the time the SS Panzer divisions, which had so worried the intelligence men, were reinforcing. Moving forward on the second day of the operation, Horrocks' tanks eventually reached the first of their airborne stepping stones, the bridge at Zon. Here, Americans of the 101st Division had captured both sides of the canal crossing. But they had to do more than hold the bridge for the operation to succeed. They had to hold the road up which Horrocks' thrust would push. The Germans were in force all around. The only ground the Allies actually held was the road itself. The American commander, General Maxwell Taylor, called it Indian fighting, remembering the US cavalry protecting wagon trains as they crossed the Old West. Throughout Operation Market Garden, the Germans were continually trying to cut the road. If they succeeded, the plan would fail.
At the same time, the British and Arnhem were fighting to reach Frost's force at the bridge, but they ran into strong SS opposition. For the British General Urquhart, the position was extremely frustrating. He couldn't talk to his commanders in the town, so he grabbed a jeep and drove forward to find out what was happening. He found himself caught up in the thick of the fighting, around the hospital, over there. As soon as we poked our nose out, we were shot at with machine guns. I just pulled back to decide what to do next, when a great big chap turned up, whom I didn't know, and, uh, and Gerald Athbury. He said, well, this is General Urquhart. General Urquhart said, come on, Gerald, we'll go and have a look. And uh, he set off straight across his road junction. All hell broke off from the left. It's when I realised how much room there is around bullets, because I was getting sprayed with bits of brick breaking away from the wall on my right and scattering moment. And by some miracle, Gerald Athbury was the only one that was hit. We got him into the first house, and a German with a machine gun appeared in the door. Roy could tell me afterwards, he said, you know, I'm the only serving general who's shot a German soldier with a pistol in a battle. I said, you weren't the only one who did. So we all shot him. <laughs> he was riddled. This is the house they were in. It was clearly too dangerous. So leaving the wounded Lathbury, they ducked out of the door, stepped over the dead German and raced off round the corner. A Dutch civilian let them in, but they could see that outside in the street in front was a German gun and its crew, shooting at British soldiers. They went upstairs into the attic. Urquhart and his companions found themselves cooped up here. They couldn't move until the German gun left the next day. Urquhart was eventually away from his headquarters, unable to influence the battle, for 36 hours. His absence meant that during this crucial period, the British airborne troops were almost leaderless. No one knew if he was alive, and coordination between units was seriously damaged. As the airborne general languished in his attic, the guards began to push on at speed. With the grenadiers in the lead, they covered 20 miles in just a few hours to link up with the American 82nd Division, which had captured the bridge at Grave on the first day. Well, my name is Moffat Burris, and I'm from Columbia, South Carolina. And I was the company commander of I Company 504 Parachute Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division. The operation just went right. It went as planned. As soon as we got within uh, rifle and machine gun range of the bridge and fired, they started waving a white flag. I think it was one of them's undershirt. And they surrendered. And at that point, we felt real good, and we said, maybe we will be home by Christmas. The British sped across the bridge towards Grosbeek, which dominated the town of Nijmegen. There were now just two bridges left between them and the German heartland. There was a good chance that Market Garden would work. The guards' tanks were here. Horrocks was on his way up the column, and the Americans were already fighting in the streets of Nijmegen. To succeed, the British and Americans had to capture the bridge there, the last before the bridge at Arnhem, just eight miles away. On the fourth day of the operation, General Horrocks arrived to join his tanks in Nijmegen. He made straight for the best viewpoint in town, the power station by the river. Today, it has been replaced by a new one. But the view is still substantially the same.
This is what Horrocks would have seen. In front of him was a huge river, the Val. To his east, the ancient city of Nijmegen, with its two bridges. The nearer one carries the railway, the further one, at that stage amongst the largest in Europe, the road. The town was already wreathed in smoke from the street fighting which was taking place. But he could see more smoke, away to the north. He could see smoke from the fighting at Arnhem. Frost and his men had held the bridge for three days now without reinforcement. But the tanks of the SS Panzer divisions were beginning to blast them out. The tactic was to uh, fire high explosive into the sides of the building to break the wall down, then fire smoke shells through that. And of course, the smoke shells have got phosphorus in them. The phosphorus sets, lights to any, uh, sets light to anything inflammable in the house, and they then burned the perimeter down bit by bit over the period of the next 48 hours. Once the water ran out uh, and the flames became um, uncontrollable, then you had to get out of the building as quickly as you could and get into another one and set that up for defence. Just a few miles away in Nijmegen, Horrocks' soldiers had had no success in crossing the bridge. They were still fighting in the streets of the town. It was time to try another approach. Horrocks held a conference here at the power station. The plan was to cross the river in force in boats. To do so in daylight was a fearsome undertaking. The Germans were securely ensconced behind a dike on the far bank of the river making the attack doubly dangerous. But if the Allies were to reach Arnhem in time, risks had to be taken. Having been ordered up from Grave the previous night, Moffat Burris was at the conference. And when we got to the top floor, already there was Colonel Tucker, our regimental commander, and General Browning, and General Horrocks. And uh, General Horrocks asked Colonel Tucker, is this an awesome task? Can your lads do it, Colonel Tucker? And Colonel Tucker's response was, well, General, if we take the bridge, will your troops be lined up ready, will your tanks be lined up ready to go? And I can remember his words as if he said them yesterday. He said, my, my tanks will be lined up in full force, hell-bent for Arnhem, and nothing will stop them. Horrex's confidence seemed boundless. Those tanks would come from the Grenadier Guards, who were now in the middle of a bitter battle in Nijmegen, fighting through houses and streets, and finally through a wooded park which overlooked the bridge. It was very slow and difficult fighting. At two o'clock that afternoon, the guns of 30 Corps opened fire on the German positions across the river. We were really horrified that uh, we would be crossing that swift river in those uh, canvas paddle boats. Because with only three, four, five, or six paddles in there, the men had to paddle with their rifle butts. While the crossing was in progress, Horrocks and Browning were watching from the top of the power station, almost like monarchs looking out over some 18th century battlefield. Unable to influence things and well aware that triumph or disaster hinged on the sheer courage of the men down here. Well, when we got about a th the lead boat got about a third away across, all hell broke loose. That's when the rifle fire, the machine gun fire, 20 millimeter fire, just open fire. The men started slumping in the boat, some of them killed, some of them wounded. I remember in my boat, um, I was sitting on the back seat with the engineer and he was standing there with the boat paddle uh, acting as a rudder. And he had 
one hand was on the side of the boat and I noticed his wrist turn red and he said, Captain, take the rudder, I've been hit. Well, just as I reached for the rudder, he caught a 20 millimeter high explosive right through his head and it just blew his head apart, just blew it off. And I was just covered with my head and shoulders and side with his blood and brains and I caught some of the uh, shrapnel in my side. When we hit the opposite bank, I said, all right, let's go head straight for the dike. Well, as we started across that pasture, those machine guns just had a complete field of fire that, that it was just running through a hail of bullets. Nobody stopped unless they were hit. The Val crossing was one of the bravest attacks of the entire campaign. Crossing the river and taking this dike cost Barris about half his company. But the survivors then had to go on and take those bridges to help the tanks to get across. When they reached the road leading to the bridge, the Americans achieved complete surprise. But then they heard the sound of tanks. They thought the tanks were German. But they weren't. They were the tanks of the Grenadiers, led by a sergeant from Lord Carrington's squadron. He, uh, he and his tanks, three tanks, whatever they were, went over and I followed him over. I thought they were going to blow the bridge up at any moment, and I imagine so did he. Um, and I was absolutely astonished when we got over the bridge. We just swarmed over the tank and started hugging the guys. I remember the guy's head that was sticking out of the turret. I just hugged him around the neck and I said, you guys are the greatest sight I've seen in, a, in years. And I kissed the tank and told them to head on to Arnhem. But the tanks didn't move. Ahead of them on the road was a German anti-tank gun. So I went over and I said, why are you stopping? Why, why, are, you, why are you not going to Arnhem? He said, well, I can't go up there. That gun will knock out my tank. And I said, well, we'll go with you and get that gun. And uh, he said, no, I can't go without orders. The guards had fought their way onto the bridge through tough resistance, and they were worried about the ground on the other side of the bridge. The road from the bridge was on a sort of embankment. And I think it would have been quite difficult to go ahead. I think it would have been difficult anyway, even in the daylight, because you were a sitting duck for anybody who was there. But I thought at night, when we'd just sort of stormed the bridge, so to speak, it would have been very difficult to push through in the, in the dark. Well, I felt betrayed. I just sacrificed half of my company to uh, capture that bridge. And... Uh, in the face of dozens of guns, and uh, they were stopping because of one gun, and they had a whole core of tanks. The tanks didn't move that night. The Grenadiers' war diary speaks of the need to consolidate the captured bridge, but it's clear that Horrocks's sense of high tempo hadn't percolated down the chain of command. Although the Grenadiers weren't to know it, there was almost nothing between them and Arnhem, eight miles away. And the plan might yet have worked, because in Arnhem, Frost's men still retain their handhold on the north end of the bridge. We had, by this time, about 300 wounded in the cellars, but I still believed that 30 Corps would be coming up, certainly up to the south bank, within a matter of almost hours. And we could, we could hear them. I think Lord Carrington was, was uh, across the bridge before we were overrun. Very, a very close run thing. <laughs> it 
At eight o'clock, I realized that uh, our little battle was finished. We just didn't have the ammunition. And when uh, the other side can uh, run tanks right up to your front window and, and, and with no chance of you uh, <clears throat> retaliating, there comes a moment where you can't go on. There was never any question of surrender. A hundred of those who weren't seriously wounded tried to fight their way out. Most of them were captured or killed. The market garden plan had called for Arnhem Bridge to be held by a whole brigade, nearly 3,000 men, for two days. In the event, 740 men held it for three and a half days. It was a heroic defence, and it's been justly celebrated. But the story doesn't end here. Three miles away, the rest of the division was still holding out around the village of Oosterbeek. At Oosterbeek, there was a ferry across the river. If the British could manage to build a bridge here, they could still push on into Germany. Here, the airborne troops made their stand. They'd been reinforced by another landing, but they'd also suffered grievous losses. Of the division's 10,000 men, only 3,500 remained to defend the crossing. The ground here, behind Oosterbeek Church, is still scarred by the pits they dug for their light field guns. They form part of an enclave a mile deep by half a mile wide, going up into the village of Oosterbeek. If they could hold this bridgehead, it was still possible that Horrocks could get his tanks across the Rhine after all. Psychologically, this was a, a sea change. Because until then, we'd been fighting to get to the bridge, and now we were going to be put into a defensive situation to hold a perimeter uh, so as to enable Second Army to come across the Rhine there and uh, to hold this come what may. Oosterbeek was an unlikely setting for an all-out battle. A perfectly peaceful Dutch suburban large village, absolute in apple pie order, as though nothing had ever happened. I had not expected to run into armour. I was certainly surprised at uh, the resilience that the Germans were showing, considering all that we'd been told was that they were demoralised and uh, that they were old men and boys and so on. In fact, uh, we had SS soldiers in front of us. As Horrocks' tanks pushed forward, after taking the bridge at Nijmegen, the airborne soldiers put up an increasingly desperate defence. Casualties were very heavy as the battle raged. Among them was James Clemenson. He was sent to a makeshift hospital in the house of a Dutch civilian next to the church. And she used to come round every evening and read from the 91st Psalm and encourage people. And she was the most marvellous example, uh, a fantastic woman who kept everybody's courage up. Only a few hundred yards away, across the river from the airborne soldiers, help began to arrive. First, by air, some Polish paratroopers. Then Horrocks' forward parties. If they could get across the river in strength, the division and the plan might be saved. Eventually, Horrocks himself came forward to take a look. Some say that he was looking pale and ill as a result of his desert wounds. He climbed the tower here at Driel, directly across from the Oosterbeek enclave. 
he could see that the key to the crossing was the small but steep hill called Westerbuing, which dominates the ferry. Once held by Urquhart's men, this position had now been taken by the Germans, who could sweep the ferry with their fire. He himself later said that this was his blackest moment of the war. With the Germans reinforcing from the east, his own force risked being cut off completely. Horrocks ordered his men to attack across the river in strength, but the assault was a disastrous failure. Horrocks and Browning realized the game was up. Rather than reinforce them, they decided to evacuate the airborne men. The following night, the surviving soldiers at Oosterbeek came up. Only some two and a half thousand eventually made the crossing. Guided by mine tapes, they crept through the woods, down to the river, through a storm of fire. The battle to force the bridges into Germany was over. A very eerie silence the following morning. None of us knew what in fact had happened. The airborne division had left behind nearly 1,500 dead and more than 6,500 prisoners, many badly wounded. One of our doctors came along and told us that uh, our soldiers had withdrawn over the Rhine and that we would be taken to a German hospital. That, that was a, a horrible feeling because it was totally unexpected. But it was a, a very lonely feeling when you abandoned. It would be another four months before the Allies crossed the Rhine again and captured the Ruhr. But by that time, the Russians were in sight of Berlin. The Allied failure was tragic, because the operation might indeed have shortened the war. Europe might have been very different, and millions of people would not have died, had Market Garden succeeded.